started. Okay, we're going, yep. Hey guys, we're going to wait a few minutes to make sure everything is going okay on the chat and you can hear us before we officially get started. Please provide some feedback. This was a last minute thing we just put up. This is primarily for uh, so people can watch it during uh, really re-record at any time. Um, but we're glad to have those of you who did be able to make it on a Friday night on such short notice be able to show up. So thank you for that. So can you hear us in the chat? Can you hear us? Hello, hello, hello. Mike, 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 Mike. Okay, you there, Richard? You there, Stephen? Richard and Stephen, are you there? Yes, we are. Well, I'm here. I believe Richard is, Sue. Yes, yes, I am. Can you guys hear me okay? Double checking, making sure everything was working. It looks like um, we got some confirmation in the chat. They can see us, so, uh, well, they can't see us, but uh, they can hear us. Definitely hear us. Good deal. So would you like to start us off, Anthony? Yeah, are we done warming up, making sure everything's here? We're good? Yep. All right, I guess we'll do an official start, the part that people will actually hear on the replay. So again, guys, uh, thanks for showing up. This was short notice. We didn't have a uh, – last time on our, on our live event, we had some 70, 75 students show up. It was pretty awesome. Um, but we had a, pr pretty much announced that live event about four months ahead of time for all of our uh, – kind of major exciting announcements that we had and big giveaway. And today is a Friday night, and it is last minute, so you guys might be the only ones in chat. So thanks for coming. Please feel free to ask questions. Um, please forgive us if we don't get to your questions, but we will do our best. So welcome to the Linux Academy show after reInvent. So what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about a little bit of the reInvent recap and really kind of what the services are. We're just going to do quick overviews. And we're also going to talk about what it means for students who are studying for the three AWS associate level certifications, as well as for students who are aspiring for the professional level certifications. So as we know, AWS did a lot of announcements. One of those announcements was a major change in lineup in their certification offering. They have removed essentially three certifications from their certification offering, and they are going to replace uh, currently, uh, they're not going to have a developer pro and they're not going to have a sysops pro. However, they are instead going to have a DevOps professional level, which can be attained, obtained after either taking the developer associate level certification or taking the SysOp certifications. You only have to take one of those to be qualified to go then take the DevOps professional certification. So really what's happened here is AWS did a lot of announcements, and a lot of that was, well, almost all of it was either developer or DevOps focused. And so we're going to talk about what that means for the certifications, when we might expect to see updates on the certification level from AWS, because even though there's an offering, they don't exactly just run out and start applying it to their certifications yet. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk and make sure that everybody understands what's going on. I think uh, Stephen has some recap for or some overview on some of the new services that are being offered. And, well, I think we'll just go ahead and start with that. So, Stephen, where do you want to start? Uh, let's start with uh, some security and compliance uh, changes that uh, Amazon just offered. Sound good? That sounds all right. All right. First, I want to talk about uh, AWS Key Management. Uh, AWS has announced that they have their own key management service. So first of all, I think it goes without saying that one of the best things that we can do to our infrastructures to secure our data is use encryption. So Amazon, up until this week, which they announced this week at AWS reInvent, was we would use server-side encryption support provided by the existing services like EBS, S3, and Amazon Redshift, which made use of master keys 
that are generated, stored, and managed within AWS. However, with the release of AWS Key Management Service, or just KMS, we can now manage these keys and applications and services running in the cloud, as well as our on-premises services, all within AWS Management Studio, within the click of just a front-end web GUI, basically. So Amazon's new encryption and key management for compliance makes it much easier for us to manage this complete uh, set of keys. You can encrypt one click via the management console and or the API because they provided some API access as well. You have one simple place to create. You can view and disable a set of policies. You can enforce automatic key rotation so that your keys are always changing. Furthermore, AWS also lets us have visibility into any changes in our keys using Amazon CloudTrail, which is basically what Amazon uses as a central logging device so we can go through and take a look at all the different changes and type, uh, who did it, and when it happened. This integrated seamlessly with AWS services already, like S3, EBS, RDS, and Redshift again. It also has built-in global high availability and a variable durable backend. <clears throat> so for example, if we have a highly encrypted data on our application, that the applications need to decrypt that data in order to view it. If we don't have high availability with key management services and that service goes down, so does our application that uses to actually view that encrypted data. So it would be bad if we use encryption data on our applications and we didn't have high availability. So Amazon built that right into Amazon key management services. So the service never stores the key on disks. It will never persist within the memory, and it limits which systems can actually connect to the device as well. So you can choose to have KMS manager. You can choose to have KMS manage and create our AWS services for us. So, for example, we would create a key. We would open up the access management conceals, and we would click encryption keys. We can either see existing keys here, or we can create brand new keys for our new encryption keys and for applications. We would then give that key an alias, add a description, and we would select who is allowed to administrate this new key and choose one or more IAM users or roles that will actually use this key to later encrypt or decrypt that data. So now that we have our key, we can easily use that with other AWS services, again, like S3, EBS, RDS, and Redshift. So for example, if I wanted to create an EBS volume that is encrypted with our key, we'd create a new volume and then select and then select encrypt this volume, and then choose that master key or whatever we gave that key name earlier on when we actually created that key within the Management Studio. Uh, as a note, this is actually available to everyone as of the reInvent conference this week. You can actually use this now. Um, the cost structure is very affordable, basically costs a dollar per key. You can manage up to about 100 keys currently on this new service. So I might also add that uh, it's not just GUI. You can actually use the API with it. Um, they already have correct. documentation out for that. So I don't know if they have command line support yet, but they do have uh, just general development API support on that. So I mean, that's, that's pretty cool when it comes to key management and security. And you know, that's really kind of, if we look at the focus around AWS announcements, I mean, let's look at, let's look at a trend based off the announcements. And, and the real trend is, uh, reducing the amount of additional third-party services that you need to use on AWS for uh, anything, whether it's key management, whether it's continuous integration, whether uh, it, it's, you know, if you look at Lambda, they have uh, really kind of reduced the amount of third-party services. They need that run specific hardware instances behind it. Uh, you know, if we look at the continuous integration tool they allow, uh, announced code pipeline, which we will talk about here in a second, it kind of replaces some of the Jenkins or Bamboo role that otherwise you would normally have, and it makes it all kind of all done within AWS and easy to communicate with it. So that's pretty cool. Thanks for the. Uh, do you have anything else to add to K? What is it? Uh, KMS Key Management yeah, Service. So, you said? Yeah. So basically, it's just KMS, which is just short for Key Management Service. So it's a great way to be able to um, manage all your keys. And I, I know I mentioned very briefly, but just as a note, you can actually use this to manage your keys outside of AWS as well. So that's actually pretty beneficial. Uh, and you may you raise a really good point. A AWS it seems that the conference this year, the major thing is let's make everything in-house. You don't need to go out to a third party to do these things. We're All they belong to us. Yeah, pretty much. 
Yes. Which isn't always terrible. Uh, but, you know, we'll, we'll probably look at that later on, what, what it means for hybrid solutions. And, you know, we'll probably look at later on, uh, you, you know, we'll have to see it running. We'll ha just have to see kind of how everything works. You know, Amazon S3, Amazon DynamoDB, SQS, SNS. These are all proven to be highly available services that have not gone down. You know, the last time there was an AWS outage, it was all EC2 related. Uh, and usually when customers have issues or when people are running applications on AWS, it's because they're not designing their EC2 instances or their environment for highly available fault-tolerant situations, and the downtime is really the fault of the administrator using or architecting the application. So, and if you look at AWS, they're just like, you know, we're just going to make this so incredibly easy, you don't have to even worry about it. Right. Well, I mean, you have to worry about it, but they're trying to help with that a little bit. So let's let's talk a little bit about one of the cool services here. We'll probably talk about this for a little bit. Is RDS Aurora one of my uh, one of Amazon's new managed service? It's uh, we'll go for it, Stephen. Sure. Uh, so basically, um, Amazon Aurora is a My MySQL compatible engine. Um, it's high available. It's high available. It's durable, fault tolerant, just as much so as the high cost that you might see in other solutions of the enterprise today, such well, hold as... On a second. Hold on a second there. I'm going to stop. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, let's talk about how it's highly available. Um, I mean, let's just, let, let's just kind of outline what, what Aurora really is so we don't, have to, uh, we don't have to necessarily focus hard on trying to understand it. Now, for, first off, for you guys out there, it's MySQL. Uh, it's, it's RDS on MySQL, architected differently. Um, so kind of what it is, when we say high, high availability, we're able to enable replication. You're able to uh, set up read replicas to external locations off-site. So you can set up a read replica from a Aurora instance to a read replica on your on-premise data, uh, on your on-premise data centers or your on-premise MySQL servers. You can also set up a, a read replica Aurora instance that replicates to a MySQL RDS instance. So, I mean, at its core, it's completely compatible with MySQL. I mean, you can import and export, and in fact, they make it easy where you can just import a snapshot from RDS. You can do MySQL dumps, and when you connect to Aurora, you're essentially connecting to MySQL. I mean, you're at the MySQL command line. And what I think they did is they kind of did what uh, MariaDB did, is forked off the MySQL, uh, but made it highly available and fast by, and you'll probably get to this in a second, by architecting the back end a little bit different. Yeah, that, that's absolutely correct. In fact, they've made it so easy for those that are using already MySQL within RDS. With just a one simple click, they'll actually take that database and they'll import that right into a brand new uh, back-end Aurora database for you. So your application can essentially actually continue running with no changes and you'll have no downtime. You'll be up and running with an Aurora backend rather than just a native MySQL on RDS backend. And, you know, really kind of the, the main benefit of Aurora over anything else is uh, it, it's the, what is it? It's the, it's the throughput performance. So, I mean, you're talking about for applications, high, high, high throughput applications. So when might you want to use Aurora over RDS in your MySQL environment? Uh, maybe you want to start off with it now. I mean, that's an absolutely okay solution, but it's probably a good solution uh for high, high throughput instances. And it might be a complete total replacement that they're going for um, rather than just high throughput. We'll just have to see what the instant size offering is uh, in terms of, you know, will they offer smalls? Will they offer regular larges? Or are they just, um, in fact, I might have it right here. It looks like the instance offering is R3 large, extra large, 2XL. So it looks like for high, high throughput and large applications, you're going to want to use Aurora. Or maybe if you're running a smaller application that doesn't require a large, R3 large, where maybe you need to run a micro or small, perhaps RDS is going to be the solution on that. And I think we'll see, well, I think we'll see that a little bit more as AWS goes forward with this Aurora, where, where their intentions lie with that. If it's really for the high throughput area, for the high performance area, big applications, or if it's going to be a total replacement. Yeah, I agree. I think it's going to be pretty exciting to see what's going to happen with Aurora in the, in the very near future. You know, what I like about it is it's really cool. When you create a new instance, you can set the maximum disk space size, right? So you're going to say, I want my volume to be a maximum 100 gig. 
But right now I'm only using one gig. So what AWS will do is it'll provision 10 gigabytes on your behalf. And as soon as you get close to that 10 gigabyte capacity, it'll automatically expand that to 20 gigabytes. So you're never going to, you don't have to provision a 100 gigabyte volume and pay for the 100 gigabyte volume like you normally would. You can say this is the max volume size I want and it will start off in the minimum and it will just automatically reprovision it as you grow so you're literally only paying for what is currently being used and it is provisioned in 10 gigabyte sprints so you know if you're at 15 gigabytes you have a t you're paying for a total of 20 gigabytes so that's kind of a that's kind of a neat feature it takes out um, a, a sysops administrator devops administrator or architect from having to uh, rebuild instances or plan i need 500 gigabytes uh, in a year and i don't necessarily want to recreate volumes or migrate instances or something. So it just kind of says, you know, we don't want to pay for it yet. It's really kind of the elastic, elasticity that's been missing from RDS. Uh, you know, the ability to scale up and down based off of demand when it comes to disk space. And that's, that's where we see some of that in terms of MySQL now. Now, we don't necessarily see that with the instance size yet. You know, it's not going to scale instances like auto-scaling but it looks like the elasticity there is coming from the disk space size. Does that make sense? Yeah. Not to mention, you know, the self-filling that you're going to get in RDS. You know, it automatically repairs failures in the background. Crash recovery is only going to take you seconds instead of hours, and you don't have to have any cache warming required with this. You have automatic re-replica promotion within minutes without any data loss, so you get all that with your RDS within this Aurora as well. Yeah, I think a lot of that goes with the MySQL RDS as well, but it really looks like they're trying to make this the high available solution replacement that uh, really is kind of missing in databases. And that, you know, they said that at the at the keynote, which was really cool to be there. Did you enjoy being there? I did. It was a good time. It was a good time. It was a good time. Um, so, do you have you have more? Do you want me to do one, or do you? Want uh, go right ahead. Why don't you Why don't you go ahead? And I'm pretty excited to hear about some of the stuff you have to do within the uh, DevOps world. So, uh, let's hack away at some of those. Hack away. Love the term. Love the love the buzzword we got there. So, you know what has been the big focus on AWS is DevOps. We're not going to get away from the the DevOps. In fact, that's where everything is going. DevOps. So, what is what is DevOps first? You know, maybe we should just do a quick recap on that. It, there's a lot of different viewpoints on what DevOps is, uh, but essentially, when we look at DevOps, it's empowering developers. It, it's really two things. It's one, empowering developers to be a part of the code and deployment process. This doesn't mean they have access to your underlying hardware. This doesn't mean they have access to your continuous integration pipeline. This means that they can promote code to master Git branches or master source control branches, whatever version or source control you're using, and that code can be deployed out to your instances. So that's part of DevOps. The other part of DevOps is, again, a buzzword that's not really as big as a buzzword anymore, is your infrastructure as code. So as operators or systems engineers or whoever we are, DevOps administrators, we're now building these application pipelines for uh, testing our environments, testing the code that's being deployed on our environments. And we're doing this using code, whether it's JSON format, uh, you know, that deploys out our environment. And then we're using configuration management tools like Chef or Puppet, which we write code to configure instances. Uh, you know, if we want to run configuration management from there, which is kind of interesting running Puppet and Chef on AWS because if you look at their deployment pipelines and continuous integration, it's almost whenever we need to make a change, we just want to throw away the old environment and push out the new environment with those updates. So is there a really need for, continu for configuration management? And the answer to that is it just depends on the type of application and type of infrastructure that you're running on AWS. You know, is it a web app? Uh, are you running you know, specific internal Linux applications or Windows applications, or is it just a web serving app where you can bake a new AMI and throw that AMI away and bake a new one with the uh, source uh, source for your application on it, with the packages or package updates on there. Uh, you know, so that, a lot of Amazon's mentality in terms of DevOps and deployment is throwing away old stuff and then just configuring new ones and deploying it out there. 
And even that, you know, Chef and Puppet play a role of that. It can play a role in configuring the new AMI and part of your continuous integration pipeline. So, you know, part of that means, uh, and when it comes to continuous integration pipelines, part of building an AMI is the configuration management on there, which could communicate with a Chef or Puppet backend server, configure its instance based off what it needs, create an AMI, and then deploy the environment. So, you know, there's just a lot going on, you know, with cloud formation, with all of this processes, and it's going to be really, really cool to get in some of these courses and show some of these different methodologies. You know, we have continuous integration, continuous deployment, which is different, and we have the configuration management. We have four or five different ways to handle continuous integration and continuous deployment on AWS. Uh, you know, that's just using CloudFormation or Elastic Beanstalk or building your own with Bamboo or Jenkins. And now, Amazon Code Pipeline, I think that's the right one for it. Is it Code Pipeline? Yeah, Code Pipeline. Uh, with Amazon Code Pipeline, where you can also do that. So it's it's very exciting. There's going to be a lot, a lot of stuff for us to learn and to understand these concepts. But, you know, if we look at uh, corporations, enterprises, where they're going, is they're going to these types of deployments. So the configuration management with Chef and Puppet. You know, there's other tools out there, but those are the two most popular ones right now. Being able to uh, build continuous integration pipelines, use Git to deploy. A lot of developers, uh, you know, you're giving developers the power to deploy to production, but responsibly, so they can promote code to master branches. That code then goes through a pipeline that pipeline has different stages in it. Like one stage would be to deploy out a test environment and run tests against your code. There's no errors during the regression or unit tests. You go to the next stage. The next stage might fire up five or six EC2 instances to run something like um, bees or cloud bees. I think it's called cloud bees, which just fires a whole bunch of, you know, load at your instances for load testing. Uh, on your application? Does it have enough instances being started at your regular auto scaling group size? You know, do you need to increase the auto group scaling size? And so we're automating this entire process and what Code Pipeline does, it allows us to actually do this. So we're able to build stages. We're able to have it build out and test your code. We're able to create a workflow. For those of you familiar with continuous integration with Jenkins or Bamboo, uh, and, you know, it's hard to say exactly how this process is going to play out with Code Pipeline because it's not available yet. There's not a lot of documentation. But really what's going to happen is you're able to uh, build those types of pipelines. It's going to read from a Git repository update. It's going to understand it's going to need to go through testing. It's going to need to go through regression tests. And each stage, it will either fail and roll back or continue on to the next stage. It'll go through four or five stages. One of those stages might be deploying a database schema updates, right? So that's part of your continu continuous integration flow. So if you have code that requires database updates, Code Pipeline will help automate that process all the way through the production thing. So that pipeline allows us to create these tasks and jobs to validate code, validate our infrastructure, test our infrastructure that passes all of our tests, deploy it out to our instances. So there's three services with Amazon that really put this together, and you don't have to use them all, so you can use uh, your enterprise Git, you can use GitHub, or your own Git servers, but if we look at the three serv services that Amazon's re released, we see a trend. So that trend is we have code commit. Code commit is a Git hosting repository. We don't have to fire instances, we don't have to launch GitHub enterprise on our AWS infrastructure. We use code commit, which is a highly available highly scalable environment automatically by AWS. It handles all of the high availability and the scaling and elasticity by itself. We don't have to do anything. And we're able to commit code in there. Part of that is our code pipeline can read from those code commits, you know, because it it's, accepts the same Git commands that our developers and us as DevOps engineers or system engineers already use. When you get that master branch, it's going to then, the code commit's going to listen the code pipeline is going to listen to the code commit branch, then it's going to invoke automatically our pipeline that we create. Pipeline is made up of stages, again, for testing or, you know, however we want to do it. Part of that could be building a new AMI. Uh, it's our continuous integration or using Docker 
or uh, building out elastic beanstalk environments. And in the end, we have code deploy. And then we can automatically have our code deploy. What our code deploy does is it listens for updates to revisions. So that's really new sets of code. It can listen to a new revision inside of Amazon S3 or a new revision from a Git repository. If there is a new revision, it will automatically, which there, you know, in order for there to be a new revision, it would have gone through the code pipeline for our regression test, our validation tests, our load balancing tests. Okay, and then once it goes through that, creates the, verifies it or promotes it to our production branch or master branch, code deploy automatically sees that, goes through the deployment process. So what code deploy does is it deploys out the code to the instances for that specific deployment. So if we have tags for three of our instances and a deployment pipeline tagged my application, it's going to deploy my application out to those three instances. So it, it's, it's really cool how it allows us to do it. We can either deploy the code to all instances at the same time, a specific percentage of the instance. Let's say we want to deploy it to one instance at a time, and there's five of them, it'll deploy it to one. If it's successful, it'll deploy it to the second one. If it's successful, the third one. If it fails on the third one, it'll automatically roll everything back to where it was and fail over automatically to our old set of code. So what, what's happening here? We're reducing a manual process of deploying code to lots and lots of servers. Uh, you know, so in there, it's, it's being integrated with these three services. Now, you don't have to use them together, but together we can create an entire continuous integration and continuous delivery pipeline environment. And, you know, that's a, that's a pretty big buzzword for everything that's going on. And I hope... I hope I, I, I kind of talked a little bit there, but what I was going for is an overview of what we can do with these services. Now, before it's stuff that we used with Jenkins, we listen to code repos, you know, get updates for repository updates to automatically invoke code that deployed it using maybe Puppet. Uh, but our code deployment pipeline can automatically invoke commands. We can say run a script on an instance when it gets to this part of the code deployment pipeline. We can say run a Puppet command. We can say install this piece of software. So we can deploy out our application in steps. If there's a step where we have to run a script that does something on our operating system before our code is deployed on there, we can create a stage for that as part of the code pipeline. So, I mean, Richard, Stephen, is, is that making sense, or am I just rambling on there? I feel like I might be kind of rambling on. No, no, you're not rambling. Um... Absolutely. I think that's actually, I mean, that's cut and dry of those three services, because they all kind of do work together. That's absolutely right. You don't have to necessarily use them uh, as one big piece, but they all definitely are sort of a marriage. They all work and help each other out. And, you know, as, as we go through 2015, we at Linux Academy are going to look a lot at the continuous integration uh, and dev, DevOps pipeline. As you kind of see, we've already added in an offering for an entire Chef learning course. It teaches you Chef and Chef uh, Ruby coding from scratch. Uh, we are finishing up our Puppet. It's already launched. It goes from learning how to manage a Puppet Master to writing modules and classes to troubleshooting. It is a Puppet Professional Certification Review. Uh, we have exercises on there. We're going to have practice exam. Um, so, you know, we're, we're trying to help give you the tools that's needed in order uh, to really kind of use these. And we're, we'll look at how Jenkins plays a role in this. We'll look at how all of these play a role with just AWS solutions. We'll look at it, how we can integrate other solutions like Bamboo from Atlassian or Jenkins as part of the pipeline instead of maybe code pipeline. You know, well, so we'll look at all of this. Stop you there. I'm really excited about the code pipeline. I, you, you'd say using something else instead of it? Well, you know, it really just kind of depends what your infrastructure is. Um, you know, if I was running solely on AWS, uh, I would probably, or at least for my AWS applications, run it on there. So, I mean, it, you know, kind of like us at Linux Academy, we have uh, an entire kind of hybrid solution. We have a lot going on. We have OpenStack running. We have AWS going. We have some VMware stuff going. Um, and so, you know, we use a wide variety of tools, and, and really it's kind of the right tool for the right job. And if AWS reduces the need for me to manage a Jenkins server or a Bamboo server to, to handle our continuous integration pipeline, it reduces 
um, management. And whenever we can reduce management on such a, such a complicated uh, and advanced infrastructure, that really helps us. Uh, because you know, if our if our continuous integration server, or Jenkins server, goes down, which helps us create stages for a continuous integration pipeline, that's something that we have to do. And you know, we're always working on creating new content, so we don't necessarily have time to manage that. So for some of our application deployments, absolutely, maybe that's the way to go. And you know, maybe we can use just that service to integrate with our on-premise. Pipeline. So if that's the case, you know, like I said, a lot of this isn't even available yet because code pipeline is not necessarily announced. Um, well, it's announced, but there's not uh, specific details on what's available, like documentation or or you know, anything like that. So seeing how the innards work on it will will absolutely be interesting. Um, but basically, we're able to create a a workflow. Uh, that has stages that we can invoke things on each individual stage. So it, it's very exciting. I think it'd be a good point uh, to go ahead and mention it. with all these new services that Amazon seems to be adding to their repository on a daily basis and changing other services and making better. We have all these tools and so I'm kind of excited to mention the next two services that sort of help manage that large ecosystem of applications that AWS has. Uh, you know, with so much change in the cloud ecosystem and AWS services, organizations in general, in general need to have something to track assets, do inventory management, and change management for their controls, and the simple governance in the cloud. You know, compliance needs to know what changed, when it happened, and how the change might affect other AWS resources when they make those changes. In the past, and mostly to date, tools were built in a way that the resources and the relationship between those resources changed very rarely. Things weren't changing all that fast. But once we got into the cloud, the tolls cost very, were very costly and very complex, and it requires a lot of care and feeding. And it requires a lot of... Sorry about that. I had someone message me there in chat. Um... But AWS Config aims to address a lot of these challenges today for fast-changing environments. So Config provides a detailed view of configurations of AWS resources in our AWS account, including the resources that are related to one another and how they were configured in the past so that you can see how these configurations and the relationships change over time. This service captures the initial state of our AWS resources, such as EC2 instances, and the relationship between them. It then tracks the creation and the deletion of the property change in analysis and, arch and archiving. You can, even, you can even enable this service with just two clicks. So it's already available today. You can actually go in and enable it. And once it's enabled, it'll discover your resources and it records their, config their current configuration, deletions and property changes. And we can actually view this configuration data within a timeline in the AWS Management Console. These changes are also streamed to Amazon SNS topic of our choice and are also snapshotted with S3 buckets of our choice every six hours. So we can then process this data using tools on our own. See, AWS Config actually understands and tracks the relationship between these AWS resources. So for example, if it knows the e to EBS volume can be mounted to an EC2 instance, and that instance can be associated with a security group or Elastic IP address, VPCs, and even the Elastic network interfaces. With Config, we can complete the full visibility into the state of our AWS resource. We can watch the items change over time and can have the full history of the configuration change, changes for resources. So as for a security and compliance perspective, we can discover all the AWS resources and determine which resources are outside of our policy scope for our organization. So for example, we might want to track down all the resources that are not within our production VPC. We might also want to see which instances have a particular Elastic IP address and what it's been associated over a course of time, say for the last week. We might even want to know that the state of the reduces of a particular date. Config allows us to view this important information. AWS has partnered with several vendors that also work with this data outside of AWS as well. So for example, Second Watch, Cloud Checker, Cloud Nexessa, uh, Red Hat Cloud Forms, and even Splunk. It's available today. Um, however, it is full. They are they are saying that it's in preview form, so it's not quite up to uh, all the 
features and bells and whistles that they plan to be adding to this, um, but it will be available completely and more of a uh, mature uh, availability uh, early within 2015. And finally, I just want to talk about one more thing that kind of pulls this all together. It's called AWS Service Catalog. And this kind of ties together with being able to manage all of our AWS services and seeing what's going on within our environment. Uh, AWS Service Catalog is a server that allows administrators to create and manage approved catalogs of resources that our end users then can then access via a personalized portal. So if you're, if you're running an IT department in a large organization, it's not easy. So Amazon wants to make able to provide to the users the latest and greatest technology has to offer, but it also have to be sure that we're setting in and maturing corporate standards because we want to provide oversight to avoid overspending and especially technology crawl and sprawl, which happens over time when you start deploying new and new. I'm sure you guys have seen that in environments in the past. People just keep deploying new stuff, and you maybe get 30 40% through the project, and they decide to deploy another new service, and there's never really consistency between those technologies. I know you guys have never experienced that before. But what AWS Service Catalog comes in, this tool allows any IT department to deliver AWS-powered services to internal users while minting consistency and control. AWS believes that it has the potential to even reduce support costs and encourage reuse which helps organizations realize the benefits of cloud computing. The service catalog is kind of broken down to a full-fledged AWS service. It has a distinct user interface. We have it for the administrator and the user. And it kind of looks like this. We have the actual service catalog itself. A service catalog exists within a single AWS account, and it's managed by an administrator and contains one or more portfolios. The administrator is responsible for uploading and maintaining portfolios of products and the service catalog. The user then interacts within that service catalog by browsing a portal containing one or more portfolios, locating a product of interest, and then they launch it. So the user can then within the same AWS account as the administrator or even within a different one. The portal itself is a view into the service catalog. It's customized to reflect the portfolio products that are accessible to a particular user. The portfolio itself is a collection of version products within the actual service catalog. Each portfolio is accessible to a certain set of users, which is determined by IAM role, group, or username within that portal. Finally, the product itself is just a collection of AWS resources, so EC2 instances, application services, databases, etc., that are initiated and managed as a unit or stack. So products can be described by a cloud formation template and multiple independent versions of products can exist simultaneously within a single portfolio. As complicated as all that sounds, in a nutshell, the administrator creates some portfolios in a service catalog, uploads products and setting some properties and some permissions, and then users can browse through personalized portals, find those, project, find those products that they want, and then simply launch them. AWS has not released this product, but it is released very soon. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Stephen. So, you know, we're going to get to, we're going to have to wrap up here shortly. So we're going to spend a little bit less time on what's left. You know, we talked about the code pipeline, which allows us to uh, listen to revisions either on S3 or GitHub and automatically deploy that code out to instances in the failback process. We no longer have to have a manual deployment process once something has been committed to maybe a master branch or a production branch uh, that goes into production. Uh, so th one of the few things which we could probably spend a lot of time talking about, and one reason I won't is because we have a little announcement about it, is the Amazon EC2 container service for Docker. So Docker is one of those uh, up-and-coming technologies that really makes packaging um, or baking together our applications in a throwable way form. Uh, so we package everything together in a Docker container that our application needs, the, the SDKs, the software required to run it, the runtimes, all that stuff. And it allows us to easily deploy that. Um, you know, AWS isn't, the service doesn't cost, it just helps us manage those containers in a deployment fashion. Uh, the reason we're not going to spend a lot of time on it is because we are uh, launching on, I don't know the exact, December 1st, a complete Docker course uh, for getting started, well, 
There's a, there's a lot of Docker in it. We'll just say that. So it's going to be a complete Docker course coming uh, December 1st. So, you know, I'll, I'll leave a lot of it for that. But that's that's something we'll end up also looking at as part of learning Docker. And, and again, we're not looking at everything just from an AWS perspective at the Linux Academy. You know, we have a lot of AWS going on at the Linux Academy. We have a lot of students learning AWS. We had nine students take a certification this week for AWS, and we had nine students pass a certification this week at AWS. So, I mean, that is that is awesome. That's really awesome. Yeah, so, I mean, that, that's exciting to see. So, and I mean, uh, we, we try to have high-quality training when it comes to, uh, you know, r regular in Linux infrastructure environments, OpenStack, Linux certifications, Puppet, Chef. So, we're going to have a good Docker course on that. Uh, the, the other thing we're going to have is we're going to be having some live labs coming out for uh, Code Deploy, OpsWorks, and Elastic Beanstalk. And when it comes to updating the certifications, so in fact, let's talk about one more service and then we'll talk about the certifications and then we'll close out um, and see what we should really expect when it comes to uh, updates from these certifications. So. The last one, I think, is, uh, you know, there were some updates to Amazon EBS, the amount of storage volume an EBS uh, device can have. So we have uh, the general SSD storage and what is it, the provisioned IOPS storage can both go up to 16 terabyte volumes now instead of... That's right. So 16 terabyte volume total, um, and you can get a heck of a lot more IOPS, uh, provisioned IOPS, you can actually get up to 60,000. Yeah, so that increases capacity over, over 100%, I think. Uh, in terms of that, if I remember correctly. And then we have a new instance type. What was that C4, Richard, did you? C4. Um, brand new instance type. It's an Intel Xenon Haswell processor. It's, um, it's a lot beefier for those bigger, beefier applications. A Xenon processor. I like Xenon processors. Like Xenon warrior processors. <laughs> those types. That's exactly what it they is. Butt and take names, something like that. <laughs> Um, and so I think that I think that leaves really Lambda service. And again, that's one of those things where it's kind of developer driven. Uh, the Lambda service is e event driven software running. So it doesn't require any type of infrastructure. It really allows us to upload right now Node.js code, JavaScript code, I think is more specifically, uh, but also Node.js. Allows us to upload code create functions. And this code can be executed based off of events that occur within our AWS infrastructure. So events such as a notification event from Amazon S3. Uh, you know, some of those could be from an upload. Some of those can be from a lost object. You know, the reduced redundancy storage. If we use the lost object event to invoke re uh, re replication or recreation of the lost object, that's something we can use Lambda for because Lambda, we don't have to have any additional resources running for it. It's just consistently listening for these types of events that allow us to create more automation through our decoupled applications on AWS. So I think it's going to be a lot of, you know, there's a lot of different use cases for it. You know, I talked about Internet of, thing, uh, Internet of Things. That really sound awesome. They talked about mobile devices. Uh, and I think as DevOps engineers, we're going to also notice it in terms of tying together and creating the ability to better decouple our applications. And we know when we decouple our applications, we create fault tolerance and high availability. So that's very important. Um, and so, you know, that's an exciting tool for that. You know, we'll be able to listen for SNS event notifications and invoke code that's executed based off of that. And that code can launch EC2 instances. That code can create objects. That code can really do anything that we can integrate with the API or anything else because we can execute code on there. Uh, they, they say more SDKs are coming, like support for Python, I would assume. They're big fans of Python. Um, there's already Node.js. So, I mean, that's that's really what Lambda is in, a, in kind of a short overview. Uh, since we kind of talked about the groups of services, we had our deployment services, our DevOps services is how I'm terming it, and we had our kind of security and configuration, AWS auditing services that Stephen had talked about, and we had kind of our two one-off services a little bit. You know, the EC2 containers are kind of a deployment, but they're not classified under deployment in terms of like continuous integration uh, on the AWS site. So that's what we had. Stephen, do you have anything before I jump into the certifications? Do you guys have any questions? 
No, I don't at this time. I, I think we've pretty much hit. There's a lot of services that came out this week, uh, and um, like always, every year there's more more fun stuff that we get to learn. Absolutely, absolutely. So let's talk real quick about associate level certifications that we have. Certified Solutions Architect, Certified SysOps Administrator, Certified Developer, all three of them offered at linuxacademy.com. And really, I, I don't expect Amazon to update their certifications until 2015, um, especially for items that are in preview or not available yet. I think we'll see updates, a big update in terms of what's going to be on there after all of those services have been available for a little bit. Uh, they did re release the DevOps, which covers a lot of continuous integration concepts. I also think we're going to see a lot of the new de deployment management tools like Code Deploy, Code Commit, Code Pipeline, uh, OpsWorks, Elastic Beanstalk. I think we're going to see a lot of depth of those services covered on the professional level certification lit coming out usually since it's in beta now it'll probably come out in January or February um, and they'll provide more details in terms of services that will be covered on there uh, I, I don't necessarily think that we're gonna see complete updates to the associate level yet you know part of the problem is is how much services can you really get on a single certification you know you have 60 questions or so and you have a lot of services that can be applied to developers um, so you know, currently it's we got everything covered right now. We're watching it regularly. I don't necessarily expect for all of the services to be required on the associate level. I don't expect for them to be added in the next month. Uh, I'm sure some of the services are probably knowledge of the services, kind of what they are, when you might want to use them. I'm sure we'll see Aurora required on Certified Solutions Architect in the near future. Uh, so we will keep our content updated and a lookout for that. We'll also keep our content updated and a lookout as we look at the AWS Certified DevOps Administrator professional level next year. So that's actually a really exciting one. I'm looking at forward. I'm looking forward to taking and receiving. So does anybody, you guys have any questions? Do you have anything to add on the certifications? Anything like that? What do you guys think about um, Microsoft going open source with .NET? That kind of brings that um, application suite over to the Linux platform. Yeah, you know, I, I think they're recognizing that Linux is a, in terms of web platform, developing platform, not necessarily a, a corporate environment where you're running SharePoint or something like that, but when it comes for startups, they're recognizing that uh, Linux is a clear choice in terms of startup companies. We're not going to buy thousands of dollars of licensing. Think, so, think of what it costs to get a ver Visual Studio license. I think they offer mm -hmm. some of it free now, but it's not cheap to develop on .NET. Um, it's also not necessarily the best experience I've ever had. I was a dot, did .NET development for about six months, one of my gigs we consulted at three years ago. Um, I have not touched it since. So. I think it really just validates kind of Linux being a superior platform, especially clear choice for startups and web applications. Um, so, well, especially when it comes to in terms of price for what you actually get. You know, Microsoft when it comes to licensing, not only you know Visual Studio, but the servers and the Microsoft licensing for the servers themselves and the cow licenses that you have to get are thousands and thousands of dollars, not to mention the servers that you have to run onto. And when Linux open source is absolutely free, it just absolutely makes sense, um, especially when there's no difference as far as performance. And I, I might go as far as to say that the performance is actually better in a lot of, in a lot of cases. On Linux, absolutely. You might go as far to say that. I will go as far to say that and guarantee it. We're talking security. We're talking, we can run Linux with bare minimum package installations. We can create things just based off what we need. We don't have to rely on uh, glumpy or clumpy GUI interfaces. You know, the more code, the more security holes. That's why we see a lot of, uh, you know, stability issues with Microsoft stuff because it's completely GUI based uh, and there's more security holes. I absolutely prefer or refuse to, except for in some Red Hat situations, run any type of GUI on a server when it comes to Linux for pure performance and security reasons. The less packages installed, 
the less uh, the less security holes, the less resources used. Uh, so, well, good job, Microsoft. Let's give them credit for that. They're finally, they're coming into the fold. The one thing we could say, good job, Microsoft, for at Linux Academy. Of course. <laughs> yeah, so um, good job, Microsoft. So, you know, that's a great question, Richard. Thanks for throwing it out there. Um, you know, I don't know that I have much else. It was a slow night in chat because of the time frame of the week and the short notice on the uh, on the uh, kind of Linux Academy show. We wanted to talk about the new services that were announced. We wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the... Uh, students who took and passed the certification at reInvent, we had nine take it, we had nine pass it. We wanted to uh, talk a little bit about where we see these services going on AWS certifications over the next 12 months, and I do see them being integrated on a specific level. When we look at AWS associate level items, we're looking at core knowledge on some things and overview on others. Uh, where when we start looking at professional level items, we're talking, uh, you know, especially like the CSA professional level and developer DevOps professional level, we're talking building out these pipelines, using them together. You know, on CSA, we're talking about building Active Directory, VPN, hybrid environments. We're talking about large-scale fault-tolerant environments. Uh, so we're taking the services we learn a lot about and the core fundamental principles we learn a lot about in the associate level and applying them in a professional enterprise level way that AWS expects us to do in environments or in professional environments. It's basically saying if you receive the certification, you are qualified to go in and do these things. You are a professional, which also means you have to have a lot of prior IT knowledge. You know, we, it's... It talks a lot about uh, Active Directory integration um, on their blueprint. You know, we're, we're going to see a lot of uh, continuous integration stuff, which means we need to know a lot of continuous integration concepts and these concepts and how they apply to Amazon Web Services, which means we're going to have to learn these concepts before we can take the exam because the service doesn't ne necessarily teach you the concept. A lot of it's um, kind of design patterns. So, you know, that's kind of just an overview a little bit about where we see the professional level certifications, they're uh, a lot different than the associate level certifications, and we're excited about them. Aren't you, Richard? I'm very excited. Steven, you're excited too. I want to hear you guys excited. Um, I'm definitely excited about the code pipeline stuff. I'm going to play around with that a lot. Um, yeah, there's a lot of good new services announced. Yeah, you'll have to use the uh, self-paced lab on that that we're going to put out there. That's pretty Definitely exciting. Check it out. Yeah, we're going to add some more of those in there. We're looking at, uh, you know, we are going to have some refresh inside of our associate level certifications that aren't even related to uh, the services that were announced. We're looking at uh, adding probably about 15 or 20 videos total throughout three of our associate level certifications and a few additional labs. Um, just kind of a refresh, a little bit more in-depth. Uh, you know, we have... I think it's 90 hours, maybe 95 hours of Amazon Web Services training material. That's uh, that's that's some depth right there. So I mean, we we've we've heard you guys. We know that you like it. We're trying to get it out there. We've heard you when it comes to Linux stuff. We're getting uh, some a lot more depth than our Linux offering as well, our DevOps offering. So I guess that's a shameless plug, but uh, a way for us to kind of announce what's going on without specifically saying what's coming or when, other than the Docker course which I did say was coming December 1st. So, cross fingers, Docker, coming there. We have a few other announcements coming later over the next uh, over the next couple months. Next couple months, Stephen and Richard, that's going to be some exciting uh, that's going to be some exciting stuff, isn't it? It is. Um, again, stuff that I can't even say right now. I want to, but they'll just have to wait. I can't wait to have a when we announce these to have a giveaway of our new special whoa 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 whoa, whoa, whoa Carl, I'm not whoa. saying it I'm not whoa. saying what it is better not I'm just saying that we saw it at reinvent brought uh, brought it there and that's pretty it cool it was it's pretty cool and it's going to be accompanied by something else that will be available in probably three weeks. On you should stage. probably stop right there. Stop. Well, I mean, it, we hinted a little bit about it in our last live show. 
We had James, the guest speaker, there for us because he's helping us oh, out. With that. Right. Yeah. Oh, I can't wait to tease people more of that. And it's complete too. It's a hundred percent complete. I know it is just right there waiting for us. It, and I could be more happy with it. It's it's one of those things that was better than my expectations. It's I, be it, great. Yeah, it really can't. It really can't come soon enough. To be honest with you. So I mean, I'm excited. That said, that. Um, we want to hear your feedback on things. It's right? nothing what people think it is. That's the exciting part. If you think you know what it is, you don't. You think you know, but you have no idea. You're wrong, yeah. If you think you know, you're wrong. You could be right, you could be wrong, but you're actually wrong. I think I think I know. Yeah. I hope okay. you know. So that's another tease. We have tease for... Uh, so we talked about a little bit of updates, talk about uh, the Docker course coming. We talked about how the Puppet Professional course is pretty much out there. We're adding some certification review stuff on there that's coming. Uh, so it, it aligns very closely with the Puppet Professional certification. So we want to see people become Puppet Professionally certified. Uh, and teased our new item and giveaway item, the two things associated together, which is really awesome. And then teasing some more announcements. Probably we might have another announcement on our December 2nd show when we talk about Chef and Puppet, really kind of some of the differences associated with it. That'll be a good talk. Chef yeah. and Puppet. And you have the announcement on December 2nd this time, don't you, Stephen? I do. Yeah. That's the one I'm excited. It's besides the biggest one that we just mentioned and we talked about for several minutes, which, by the way, guys, really is the coolest thing ever. I have yeah, another... I think we're probably launching December 2nd. Probably. I hope so. I, I mean, we can't let our users wait any much longer for this. All right. We will launch it December 2nd then. We'll show something December 2nd. I'm sure we can do it. Because it's finished. We just got to put the stuff together for it. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. December 2nd it is, though. Absolutely. And so we have two cool announcements on December 2nd. And that should be the day after our Docker course becomes available. So right December's going to be an exciting time. That's not even talking about the other stuff coming later in December. I'm worn out just thinking about it. Me too. It's not for a nap. I guess it's just time to go to bed. <laughs> it is time to go to bed. Well, that concludes it then. It is 9.59 Central Time. That is right at 59 minutes for the show. Lots of teasing, lots of talking. Thank you guys for showing up. Uh, it's really exciting. We look forward to talking about it more and getting some of the... Uh, content out there. Thank you, Stephen, for coming, showing up on a Friday night. Richard. Glad I could be showing here. Showing up on a Friday night. And Richard, did you, get, did you get a shirt? I ended up getting you a shirt, finally, because I saw you in person at reInvent. I can't find it. Oh, 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 you lose that shirt already. <laughs> Some lucky person now has a Linux Academy shirt. And we did. I just sent out a box of uh, nine shirts today from winners from our last show. So we have given away all, I think we did almost 20 shirts. So, And that's not even our new giveaway item. Uh, so that's going to be kind of neat. That concludes it for the Linux Academy show. Thank you guys for showing up. This will be available via our iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube probably, the blog, as well as the Linux Academy show course inside of linuxacademy.com. We'll we look forward to seeing you on our December 2nd show, and we'll see you oh, then. One more thing. Um, everybody who left the chat will be punished. Punished. You just completely messed up my ending. I mean, that was a fantastic <laughs> ending. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to hit stop. Yeah, so the guys in chat, you should be like, they did something so amazing. And <laughs> make them feel that <laughs> Come in there. And then we'll just kind of we'll cut it off on the recording. Maybe we should have actually done something amazing. Okay, I'm going to cut it. Bye, everybody in chat. Thanks for hanging out.